have any papers? Is anybody any papers? Yeah, I'm turning in a paper. Is it, oh, John Patton here? He is not. He's not here. Unfortunate. It's um, a very tragic I don't think it was a thing. Simon Purdy? I'm ready. You're here, okay. Let me see, maybe. Let me see if I have something to discuss there. Well, we look at it. Okay, you are here. Does anybody have a paper for me? Yeah, here you go. Good, wonderful. I look at that in the next time. So we have two more meetings. And then you're all liberated. Okay, very good. Okay. Very good. Let me see. David, do you want to sit over there? No, I'm fine sit? here. Well, whenever you do we have John Patton too? No, I mentioned him already. Okay, then your presentation. Then we have another one, Majid Al Sunaidi. Not here neither. Somebody, somebody coming there. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me look look at it later. Okay, here we have the contemporary issues. Oh my god. Okay. Today we have the discussion, discourse number uh, number three, number seven, eight, and the notion. Let's see where we are. Do we have somebody who will send something to us today? You okay. So we will have time for you. And then we discuss whatever you want to tell us. We do that a little bit later. Okay, discourse number eight. Now we are further than eight. We are ten. We are further than ten. We are and eleven to the correction. We have that too. And now we come to... Okay, here we are. Discourse number twelve, social technology. So that would be about Luhmann and uh, Parsons. Are they familiar to you? I mean, they are positivists. Have you heard about Luhmann? Yeah. About Parsons? Parsons. Parsons, yeah. Parsons. Luhmann is the German student of him. So, Luhmann is the German Parsons. Okay, um, let me say something ahead of all the other things we want to do. In the last two or three uh, meetings, we want to get our, what do they say, our head around <laughs> things or whatever. So, now, uh, just picking out one thing, we went into a lot of details and we saw that there are not only one critical theory, but there are different critical theories. You could say that the critical theory of Habermas is different from Horkheimer and from Adorno and um, from Hannes and so on. And so then the question is, if we have a plurality of and that even Hannes is different from Habermas. We saw Habermas emphasize language, the other one emphasizes recognition, and uh, they both of them are different from uh, from from is a psychoanalyst and has a psychoanalytical uh, theory, social psychology. So they are different, but do they have something in common? Now that is our issue. And here, the uh, Hannes gives us in his titles of his books gives us in a certain sense what they have in common. What they have in common is the pathology of normalcy, as Fromm calls that, or the pathology of reason, or the pathology of will. Now, pathology means, of course, the science of illnesses. So it comes from medicine. Um, so it comes particularly from uh, sicknesses of the human organism, or animal organisms, or whatever. So that some kind of an organ gets hardened, doesn't function anymore, medicine is used, sometimes poison, in order to make that organ moving again, because the whole of the organism has to be in flux. And if something is not in flux or so, then it's ill. And Hegel already and Kant and so on, they put also the mental illnesses together with the organic illnesses. So. Um, that is interesting because that led to a development where psychology is not really uh, a social science, but psychology is a biological science. It's a natural science, and that is what it is on our campus. Uh, Skinnerians, they, now not all psychoanalysts do that, but they emphasize very much 
the organism and it is the illness is then not situated in human subjectivity but in something between the organism and the human subjectivity and we could call that psychosomatic so it goes under that name psychosomatic and then you have psychiatrists and they give you pills and they change the chemistry of the brain and so on and um, then of course you can also have psychoanalysts who do that language therapy that, that they talk about dreams and tendencies and feelings and impulses and, uh, and, and so on and so on. So, um, okay, so now uh, what um, when we, so we have explained somehow uh, what the pathology is. Now can one use that word pathology which fits the organism and maybe also our emotions and so on, does that also fit society? That is the issue. So uh, is there an analogy between functions and structures of society or that these structures harden, get in the way, so that they don't function anymore and threaten the survival of the um, of society, as, uh, as Parsons would say and Luhmann would say too. Now, but when we know that the organism or the psyche or the society is sick, we have to have something else. Namely, we have to have an idea of what a healthy organism is. Otherwise, we could not say that it is sick. And here we have now this problem. And we, I want to refer, refer to one sentence by Horkheimer, who founded the whole thing. Um, Horkheimer wants to make clear what the Jewish tradition, where he comes from, what the Jews have in common with idealism. Because when the Jews, during the bourgeois revolution and enlightenment, they were emancipated. That means the bourgeoisie, the third estate, against the feudal lords and against the clergy, said that what counts first of all is our common human nature. And that I am a Jew or a Catholic or a Protestant or whatever, an American, that is secondary. So. The Jews were, first of all, so would fish to say, and shelling, and so on, that the Jews are, first of all, human beings. And secondly, they are Jews. And therefore, they have to treat, be treated, first of all, as human beings. And therefore, they were allowed to get out of the ghetto and enter all the professions, and uh, long preserved energies were let loose. And you have famous, from Mendelssohn on, famous Jews in all branches in economics and political economics and sociology and everywhere in politics and so on. And then the backlash, the fascist backlash, and we have that in our movies, there in our discussions. So and now, um, but the question is now why the Jews uh, fell for German idealism. That is the question. So um, why, and, and not only German idealism, but also uh, those great scholars who came from German idealism, like for instance Marx, or in a certain sense also Freud. So, and the reason be why the Jews were so attracted by German idealism, and we talked about German idealism, we talked about Edison and Thoreau and uh, Walt Whitman here, the great poet who said that a great country needs a great uh, uh, philosopher, and that Hegel was this philosopher, and so on. We were aware in this country, and now we don't have one. And that you can see in every news report there, or every politician who talks, you can see that this is missing, painfully missing. So, but how to get it in, that is another question. But let's, let's follow the argument. So, what do they have in common? According to Horkheimer, what the Jews, and that includes also the Christians, because the Christians are fundamental Jews. During the um, Nazi uh, persecution, there were a lot of Christians uh, who would say, we are all Jews, and that was very dangerous to say that. But in a certain sense, sense the Christian thinking is Jewish thinking. If I take uh, my students to the rabbi, as I do, then the rabbi, and I say, what, uh, what is in the uh, Sermon on the Mount? What is in the Sermon on the Mount Jewish? What specifically Christian? He says, 1%. 1% is specifically Christian. All the others Jewish. So even think, love your neighbor, book Leviticus, of course. Love your neighbor, uh, imitate God. So not imitate Christ, but imitate God. It's there in Judaism. So that 
is denied by fascists. Now, here we have a thing, we mentioned that, you know, Hitler uh, thought that uh, Jew, Jew, uh, Jesus could not have been a Jew, but the population in general, um, or also Katya, who comes from Russia, so in Russia as well, that means the Jewishness of Jesus was forgotten. He was the son of God, he was the son of man, and uh, that he was male was not important, that he was a Jew was not important, his age was not important, and so on. So we call that monophysitism. The uh, divinity of Christ is emphasized so much that the humanity disappears in the process. That means also his teaching, and that is very comfortable because you don't have to follow his teaching. So the Protestants here would say the Sermon on the Mount is only there to show us our sinfulness. Well, that was not the purpose. The purpose was to get them out of their damned sinfulness. But they want to go on in their sinfulness, and therefore they repress the food stamps, and they repress the minimum wage, and they repress the unemployment compensation, and so on, and so on, and so on, as we see it daily going on here. So, okay, so nevertheless, what brought these Jews who were emancipated? That means uh, they're equal citizens now. Uh, not by Christians, uh, but by the Enlightenment, by the bourgeois Enlightenment. Not yet the Marxist Enlightenment, which follows. Not yet the Freudian Enlightenment, which is following, right? We are bourgeois Enlightenment. Now, we should be familiar with this, because this country is the result of the bourgeois Enlightenment. Our constitution is the French constitution by the encyclopedists. It was taken over here by Americans, the fathers in Philadelphia, who had studied in France and got it all over, right? It is, did not fall from the sky. It is an amazing type of a document. It was not done by a bunch of uh, farmers or slaveholders or whatever. It's a high-level thing, and the bourgeoisie itself, those damn shopkeepers and so on who made the revolution, didn't even do it themselves. They had traitors who came from the, uh, from the, the clergy, so bishops and noblemen who could write and who uh, uh, possessed the monopoly of education in the upper classes, they helped them by writing these, uh, these documents, right? So it is uh, coming from far away. Okay, so, but now this sentence now, that is of all importance because it, it can be a key by understanding all that what we said here. And wherever we went into details and particulars and, and the particular critical theory and so on, and that is the following thing. What they have in common, the Jews and the idealists, is... First of all, a sense for reality. A sense for reality. That means they are not dreamy or whatever. They see reality in all its brutality. That means they see that the historical process, as you can see it uh, all the time, um, uh, with our bombing people daily, with our uh, pilotless airplanes and so on, the butchery, it is a slaughter bench, as Hegel said, it's a Golgotha where people are crucified, where whole nations are crucified uh, and, and, uh, continually. So uh, look what's going on in Syria, look what's on in Iraq, look what's on in Afghanistan. Six policemen were yesterday were blown up by, by the Taliban and so on. So daily, 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 that's history, right? Now I'm emphasizing so much because we as normal people live in the family or we live with friends or we live in the neighborhood. That means we live what Habermas calls the life world. This life world is far away, even from civil society, for instance, what the corporations do. It is even further away from what the state is doing. It's even further, further away from what happens in history. So the normal little creature he's preaching around here has no idea what happens in, in history. We saw that psychologically when we, I mentioned that when we saw the Hitler movie, the secretaries had the feeling, you know, that Hitler was such a nice, uncle or grandfather or he had understanding for the anxieties and the types and, and all this. But then suddenly when he talked about history he was completely different. And this woman whom we saw the secretary talked to Eva Braun the wife of Hitler and said you know he can be so unbelievably friendly but then when he talks about history or an officer comes in and so he becomes icy cold in the process. So that is the difference of the dimensions. What happens in history is unimaginable uh, in the family and, and so on. What is they talking about there? I hope we can stop him. Good, he stops himself. <laughs> Self-regulating. Himself, yeah. So, uh, so that, uh, you know, this is where, where then this whole Hitler thing uh, took place.
days, so it is therefore possible that I grew up in Italy, Germany, and the sun was shining, and I went, and went, I went swimming, and as long as the bombing didn't start, you did hardly uh, feel anything, but at the same time, the concentration camps went on already, forced labor went on in civil society and in the state and international relations and so on. So that means the average human being is somewhat sheltered, he sits at the uh, fringe of the ocean of history and doesn't notice anything and doesn't want to know anything. So Americans don't want to know what the state, the American state, the crimes they commit in Central America, South America, or whatever. The Germans didn't want to know the crimes which the German army committed in the East and the West and so on and so on. They are sheltered. It is repressed inside and and they are not told half of it anyway, and they don't even have to repress it, and so on. So that is something which sociologically we have, and social psychologically we have to be aware of. So, nevertheless, the Jews and the idealists have a keen sense, and even a brutal sense, of the reality of society, of the state, and of history, different from what average nice little people are doing. So that is one thing of the contradiction. We have a central antagonism here, a central contradiction. And what is on the other side? On the other side is the idea. Now, it is not, you know, I just had the idea to go to the zoo or something like that, as people use that. Um, the word idea is totally ununderstandable uh, for us. So what is an idealist? Carter is an idealist. Why? He wants to make peace all the time. Of course, no <laughs> peace comes. So therefore, idealist, it is used ironically. Ha, he is an idealist, you know. Uh, he, um, he does the charity stuff there and so on. So he's not dangerous. Everybody likes him. The bleeding, bleeding hard liberals, they're all idealists. So, but it is not that what is meant. So we have to do a hard work to understand what in God's name the idealist meant when they used the word idealism. And we have we started with that already because we know there's the subject of idealism of Kant. So that is a Copernican turnaround. That means uh, we cannot be naive realists anymore that we think the tree there is as I see it. But we know that our experiences of that tree or whatever else we experience, that this depends on fundamental concepts in our brain, uh, not that you can study it from outside. The brain uh, physiology will not get us there. Uh, so these categories inside, like space and time and causation, they are subjectively present. These are the ideas in the subject which make our experiences possible. So if we don't reflect on it, you know, we just experience the tree is a tree, you know, flower is a flower, and so on. But in reality, there is a process going on through my eyes and through my brain, and the impressions which I get through the eyes, through the ears, and the touch, and so on, are organized by categories automatically without me even even uh, aware of it. And if I would take machines to test my brain, it could not be noticed at all which category I have or whatever. What can be noticed is when I get a sexual attack, when I've suddenly been turned on by somebody. That you can see, but that is an animal function. So, but uh, thinking as such, it would be very hard to see if I do a liberal thinking or a fascist thinking or whatever to test that and find any machinery which could reflect that. Well, but that's not our point now. The point is subjective idealism, right? So what, what that means, very concretely, it is the same thing what Copernicus and Galileo did <coughs> when they said it's not this uh, earth which stands still and, and the sun turns around, but it's the sun which stands still, and that's not, it's, it's not even true, and, and we are moving. So <coughs> that's what appears to be so solid, namely there where we are standing on. That thing is moving when we look at this shade there which comes here into the room and so on. So that was the turnaround. The same turnaround took a, a, a place in Kant. And I'm not so sure if our population has really gone beyond Kant or our philosophers. We, uh, we had a, a guy of the post office, he taught Kant, Kant philosophy. He was the only one who made it at least to Kant. Nobody ever made it to Hegel or whatever or beyond. So um, that, uh, 
therefore people in, in this country are to a large extent still um, uh, uh, naive or immediate type of an immediate consciousness in the phenomenology of mind Hegel goes through all these forms of consciousness and that would be one of them so now then we have objective idealism what does that mean now it means that these categories which are in my brain have a correspondence in the things out there uh, in the trees or whatever so that means there is a correspondence between the categories in my own subjectivity and the objective categories which are at work like the purposiveness in the tree which regulate the teleology which regulates the growth and the the assimilation process, the chemical process, and the genus process in which the tree uh, produces another tree, doubles itself up, and so on and so on. All that is teleologically. So, but that's not only in my brain now, but that is also going on out there. So, also a category like dialectics. There is a subjective dialectics in my brain, but there is a dialectics going on in the tree as well. The seed contains already the whole tree, and then that is the universal which particularizes itself and then singularizes itself in a new seed which contains all the development before. And that is a process which I do not project into it, but which is there. So there is a subjective dialectics and an objective dialectics. And now comes the, the absolute um, uh, uh, idealism, and that is what, uh, what uh, um, Hakama means. So the Jews and the idealists, on one side had this keen sense for reality. They didn't hide it from themselves. On the other hand, so when you read the book Daniel and, or you read a prophet like Daniel or a prophet like uh, Jeremiah or whatever, you see the brutality with which he describes what the Babylonians do, what the Egyptians do, what the Jews do, how Yahweh is inside of this whole process, this painful process how Yahweh himself suffers when suddenly the Jews pray to Bel, pray to Bel or to Baal or to any other god of, uh, of Mesopotamia or of Egypt or of Greece or whatever. So, um, but it is a slaughter bench, the whole thing. Women and children are destroyed by this guy and uh, then God calls the Babylonians to punish the Jews, but then he calls the Egyptians to punish the Babylonians, or he calls the Persians, Cyrus, and so on, in order to punish the Babylonians. And so the whole thing is a brutal type of a process. And it's so brutal that Form even said, I will not take this. <laughs> I will not, I, I, it's not the good side of it. So he, he takes out, they take out the second or the third commandment, but they don't want to have anything to do with that cruelty. But nevertheless, that is this keen sense of reality. You can translate this, for instance, in reality politics, you know. So, um, realpolitik, the word, comes from Bismarck, a great German uh, statesman who had, by 1870, he had already the health insurance, <laughs> and we don't have it now even, so he did this, he was a conservative, but he did it in order to, that the Social Democrats wouldn't do it. Since we don't have a Labour Party, nobody does it. So, and we sneak along like little snails and so on. So, the uh, nevertheless, then Realpolitik was also used by, used by Hitler, then by the fascists. So, Realpolitik means, look, I have not made that what's going. I'm not responsible that nature is a process in which everybody eats everybody, and that this continues really also into history, where also everybody eats everybody. The capitalists feeds on the, on the workers there and one country, the colonial country feeds on the colonized country and so on everybody eats everybody so um, I have not do done that but I want to make sure that I am not the one who is eaten I am not the prey but uh, I am the predator you can only be the prey or the predator if you are not the predator, you are the prey so that is true for your country that is true for your civilization so therefore he wanted to the Slavs should be his uh, prey and uh, so like the capitalist had the workers for his prey. You may even treat your prey well. Uh, so the slaveholders down there, they had health care for their slaves, otherwise it would have been too costly. They, if he lost one, he lost a lot of capital. So, um, and he paid them also in, in winter when they didn't have to work, so they had unemployment compensation. They were much better off than many workers in the capitalistic system. 
So um, they had the housing, they had the clothing, in spite of the fact that it didn't work for three or four months. So uh, this, uh, uh, so that, um, that that is real politic now. Uh, you know, I have nothing against the Russians or whatever, but uh, you know, they are destined somehow to be uh, to be uh, uh, the prey. And uh, then the Germans, you know, were too weak, and so they became the prey in 1917 18. The Versailles dictate, which Hitler always said, you know, they preyed on the Germans. They pumped the money out. They pushed the inflation, you know, under the ceiling and so on. They uh, pushed them into a depression. That was Hitler's revenge for that. That means he said, we will not go on to be prey. We will become predator. Heil, heil, and everybody shouts, but this is a good message, you know. Uh, brutal as it is, but that is real politic. And here in this country, who is it? Cheney, the gangster, <laughs> the super gangster in this country. While the Bushes are ashamed, you know, to show themselves, and they cannot show themselves because uh, when they go out of the country, they have to be delivered to the next court. So this uh, military guy, they wanted the, the secretary of defense there, Amsfeld, Amsfeld, they persecuted him already in France, and he had to run to Germany and go into an airplane and uh, go as fast as possible. Even when Bush was in Ottawa, when he was still in office, they started already procedure, in spite of the fact that he had still diplomatic protect protection. The whole Bush thing, is, the whole Bush cabinet is under suspicion of war crimes, and every state in the UN has to deliver them to Den Haag. So, and so, therefore, they are, they are a little bit in the background. And when they come out, they show themselves to be friends with Clinton and, and so on and so on. So, in order to look harmless, and they go in their life way and whatever. But this Cheney, he has no feeling of shame whatsoever. So, he gave a speech just to the Republican uh, group there. So, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that is, he is a real politic guy. We should have bombed, or we should bomb uh, uh, Syria, and we should bomb Iran. He wants to bomb Iran too, and, and so on. So McCain comes sometimes close to that too. So we have a few real politicians there who are, you know, uh, hawks, and they want to bomb everybody. And and when you bomb, then you have respect. Under Obama, we lose respect from everybody. So if we had bombed them, then the Russians would never have done that in the Ukraine. What the hell have they done in the Ukraine? Well, they have a next, they haven't a next anybody, and so on. So this is also the, the ideology of death which these people produce. So in terms of realpolitik, you have one of the most stupid and most criminal in Cheney. His face already shows the whole thing. He's like with a bulldog type of a dog. He is uh, running around there. So it's an awful incarnation of uh, whatever is evil in this country or in any other country. Okay, so we have this uh, on one side. We have this sense for reality, and uh, that uh, Hitler had, and that Cheney has. Uh, if they are criminals or not criminals, they do have that sense what is really going on. And they have no illusion that man is a killer, and that the killers there in the, in the prison there, we all could be there. If the circumstances were different, if we were not afraid of the, of the police or whatever, we could all be there. So we all have the murderer inside. It's just unconscious. At any moment, can unleash it. So Goering would say, you know, no matter if you're a fascist or a liberal or a socialist, when you tell a nation you are threatened, they want to kill you, you know, then their own killer instinct comes out and they start killing and so on. So that is that is the sense for reality. So that, I hope we understand, but even that's not so easy to understand, because people running around look so harmless, you know, and, and uh, not everybody uh, is witness of, of some of these crimes which continually happen. If the police would go on vacations for one day, you know, you would all be killed down in Kalamazoo. So um, that means every little step, every square meter of this country has to be policed from the morning to the night by the local police. Look at our campus there. We have these little poles with a telephone where you can run to when somebody rapes you or whatever. So, or, or the rape number in the universities, the rape numbers in the army and so on. So you can see that it's an you know, awful type of thing, which, which we cover up. You know, we have to be optimistic in the news. They smile all the time, the blonde girls and, and so on. So, but behind that, there is, there is a nightmare. <laughs> so, but what is the other side now? Okay, so the other side can be subjective idealism, or it can be idea. The Greek word means just an image, 
and such, but that hasn't helped us very much neither. So, and then objective idealism is that there are categories, that there is reason at work in nature and in society and in history, that it all has a purpose. And then comes this absolute idealism. That means that nature and the world of man are somehow held together by something more embracing, by the concrete universal, as it is called, or by the absolute, or by the unconditional. And so there are different names for that. And in Judaism it's called Yahweh, or it's called uh, Adonai, Lord, or Elohim, or whatever. And uh, so in Christianity as well. I always I meet people all the time who would think that Jesus did not believe in Yahweh. Of course, the God of Jesus was Yahweh. And Yahweh was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, Yahweh was the God of the living and the dead. And the same thing is true for, for Mohammed. Mohammed believes in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I just took my, my classes to, uh, to the Imam, and the Imam says, I believe in all those messengers. I believe in Noah and in, 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 uh, uh, Abraham. I believe in Moses. I believe in Jesus, and so on. So it is the same God. I don't know why the hell where they get this idea from that it could be anybody else. There are three Abrahamic religions. They are the same faith community, and then come with different uh, proposals and so on. But they're very similar. So very similar laws, uh, and, and so on. So, nevertheless, that is what is called the idea now. And we saw already that the that Horkheimer and the others um, have believed in this second and third commandment, namely that you cannot make any images of this idea. It cannot be expressed. But it is. It is, but it cannot be expressed. It is, and it cannot be named. So in the in the chapter 20 of of the Exodus, there the the uh, imagery is quite clear and radical. So God will punish those who make images of this idea into the fifth and tenth or whatever uh, generation, and He will reward those who love Him. That means who will not make any false images or what any images whatsoever. But with the names, it says to abuse the names. So uh, you could think, you know, that there would be a name which would not be an abuse. But since the idea is infinite and the language is finite, all finite words are an abuse. So that radicalization the Frankfurt School did. And they combined this inhibition, a prohibition of names and images of the idea uh, which Moses gave to um, to Kant, and so you have a philosopher, you and and on one side you have a religious person, and uh, they are part. You know, by Moses is about 1200 before, uh, and Kant 1800 after, and so on. They're about thousands of years apart of each other, and uh, Kant is of course the great German Enlightener, so he is the German version of the French Enlightenment. He's part of the bourgeois Enlightenment. And both of them now do not allow to say what the idea is. Kant expresses it that way, that the analytical understanding which underlies all our sciences, sociology and so on, cannot penetrate the thing in itself, which is God, immortality and freedom. It has to stay out of it. What happens if they go into it? Then this analytical understanding, that reason, gets confused. It falls into contradictions. Kant calls that antinomies. That means laws which contradict each other. And so uh, then you, you have the contradiction that uh, God is good, but then he creates there are bad things in his creation and so on. Or God is almighty, but he's also good. But he, or he's good and he's also just and so on. These qualities or these names all contradict each other. So therefore, this idea is, but it cannot be described. So the critical theory is now, uh, in order to understand that a little bit more, because what the idea is, you see, when we talk about it, it falls right away to that uh, everyday type of a thing. I have this idea, or maybe I eat spinach today, or whatever, which is subjective, uh, stupid thing which gets to our mind, which is not even a real thought, or whatever. So therefore we have to try to make it clear phenomenology what is meant with this idea. So we have made some steps now. But if you go back into the history 
of thought then later, of course, had the idea, right? That is where it comes from. And what was the idea? The idea was absolute goodness, or the idea was absolute beauty. And now that goes also into practical life now. Let's see homosexuality, right? The Greeks wanted to reach this idea, namely the idea of beauty. And the, in order to do that, you had to, it had to be mediated by finite beauty. Now, normal people see beauty in girls, for instance, but the Greeks had functionalized, and we do that too, had functionalized women to such extent in terms of the family and having children and so on, that in spite of the fact that they were naked in the swimming pool and the genders were swimming together, they nevertheless could not see beauty in women. So therefore, they could see the beauty only in men and in young men. Here we have the child abuse thing, which is something so uh, peculiar for us, which is only possible after you repress the whole thing. So therefore, Socrates had Alcibiades, and Alcibiades was much younger. Uh, they had rules, how young the boy could be and what you could do, what you couldn't do, and so on. But um, uh, uh, Socrates was married uh, with Tantippe, and he, had, uh, he married very late and uh, had two children, which were very young when he was executed still. So, uh, and uh, he, uh, he somehow through the beauty of Alcibiades, he was able to transcend and to rise to beauty itself, to the idea of beauty itself. When you had achieved this, then you didn't need Alcibiades anymore. That means uh, the homosexuality was just a way, a means to rise to this universal, um, to this concrete universal called beauty, one form of the idea. So therefore it went right into practical life and when Socrates was sentenced because he seduced youth. It was not that he seduced him into homosexuality, but he seduced him to the liberal arts. That means that they could think dialectically, and that was useless for practical life. So one boy, he was drawn into Socrates' circle, and he learned the uh, liberal arts, and, uh, but they had a, a business to color skins, and what slaves usually did, but they were free and did it, and they wanted the boy to inherit it, inherit it. And so at a certain point, the boy said, I love my parents, and he left Socrates and went back to the parents. And then he was so unhappy, if you are once liberated, and then you have to sit in an office for eight hours every day, and so on, you would blow up. So therefore he was so unhappy, and uh, in order to, to do, overcome the unhappiness, he took drugs, then alcohol and, and uh, got drunk all the time and the parents blamed uh, Socrates for having seduced him into that free life so that he was to the liberal arts so that he was not fit any longer to the servile arts. That is a very great problem for our universities. We had liberal arts on campus and we changed the name because if you have liberal arts you have to have servile arts. So the engineering complex, for instance, that would be the servile arts. And in order to overcome that class division or whatever, we called it the School of the Arts and Sciences and left the liberal out. <coughs> but it is still a problem. You know, One problem is that the university becomes a trade school and that it uh, just uh, promotes the uh, servile arts. And the servile arts you can also sell better than the liberal arts. And so that we had one in our department, a chair, who said, you will never get a job, you'll never get a job, and canceled the philosophy, uh, the doctorate of, of the department, and so on. So it has a tremendous amount of, um, of come and the, the students may be in cahoots with this development because they say, you know, what should I, liberal arts, you know, learn music or whatever, you cannot do much with it, you know, but if you on computer business or any other engineering thing, then you can make money and, and so on, or you go get an MBA or whatever, and then you make money. And uh, I mean, it's, it's sad. I had that in my own family where people are so fascinated by making money that they then make money but have absolute boredom for the rest of their lives and are unhappy. And they get older and older and have less and less chance finally to, to do something else. So, 
but I mean that is a decision which which has to be made. It made Grantshire in the same way. They all want to go into accounting or into uh, the banking business or whatever, and all these unproductive type of things which are servile arts. And when you tell them, you know that they, why do you work for an owner or so? Then they say they don't have any owners. They say they are the owners themselves. And then even when they see in the news there that the Hobby Body or Hobby Bobby or whatever the name Hobby Lobby. Hobby, Lobby. Hobby yeah. What is it? Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is the idiotic name. But nevertheless, <laughs> they, they have owners. Like everybody else has owners. So he owns 13,000 people all over the place, artisans and, and all this. So they are owners, of course, and they regulate everything. But that is part of it. So these owners also want to get rich and they pay a little bit something to others and rob them of their surplus value, which makes them richer, and the others don't get anywhere, uh, except, you know, that it depends. It's very relative. So if they pay a good wage, uh, these people may not mind that they produce surplus value for others. Only when they keep them too low and don't give them any more wage, then they start protesting. <laughs> okay, so now we want to make clear what this idea is and if you forget it again well it doesn't matter I hope you will meet somebody someday who will remind you of it because um, it is of utmost importance if you study sociology or whatever you do if this antagonism which Jews and idealists have in common if this is there or not that means that you say no matter how hellish that thing is or that your wife dies and your children die or whatever or you lose your job or whatever that you say no matter what reality is like I will stubbornly hold on to this idea because that is what, what counts and this idea is what Plato called the good or beauty and everything had to serve it and that is the truth what is called the absolute truth you will never hear in the sociology department about absolute truth in, except that it doesn't exist. So that's what they call, so it is either the absolute beauty or it is the absolute being or it is the absolute truth or whatever. So that is the counterpole between those two. And the reality continually contradicts this idea. So therefore there is an antagonism which one has to carry through in one's life. And the Jews have done that for hundreds and hundreds of years of persecution they followed the law which no state enforced or whatever uh, because they held on to that idea no matter how much they were persecuted killed or whatever and the early Christians of the first 300 years or so did the same thing and here we know also this mysterious thing which we use all the time positivism right? a positivism is a man who has the reality without the idea. That is why the Frankfurt School people have this uh, opposition, particularly when religious people become positivistic, and you have a lot of them around here, because it means then religious people who have no idea. That is the most extreme idiocy. Okay, now, uh, we, if we look at the student of Plato, Aristotle. What is the idea for Aristotle? The idea for Aristotle is the gnosis gnosios. That means the one who knows himself as knowing. That is his definition of the absolute or of God or whatever. Or you have them in the Middle Ages where you see that uh, the uh, Thomas Aquinas would say that the uh, idea is being. Or you would say before him, Anselm of Canterbury, whom the Frankfurt School people uh, thought very highly of, very uh, intelligent people, a uh, person around the year thousands. He developed the so-called ontological proof of God there is an idea higher than which we cannot think any anymore and this idea must contain being otherwise it would not be the highest idea and so Hegel accepted that too but the somehow uh, Anselm of Canterbury did not prove that it was so he simply had this conclusion that the highest idea had to contain being otherwise it would not be the highest idea. But what Hegel did, he started out with being and went through essence and hundreds and hundreds of definitions of the absolute until he came finally to the idea and thereby had proven that the being is in the idea. 
and not only asserted it. That is very important. So this ontological proof of God has collapsed uh, after the First World War and then the Second World War. So that means that our poetry, our, our art, our politics and so on are without this proof. It was not only the last it developed in Christianity. The other proofs were all there with Aristotle already. And the Arabic Aristotelians had it too. That means the cosmological proof of the idea was there, and also the teleological proof was there, but the ontological was not there. And this ontological proof, which is the third one, is already presupposed by the two others because you have to presuppose already the idea before you want to, pre to prove it. In terms of a cosmological thing, there are finite things. Finite things presuppose the infinite, therefore the infinite is. Or there is teleology in the nest building and everywhere in nature, and um, the, such teleology presupposes an intelligence. This, in, this in, teleology exists everywhere, so therefore there must be a highest intelligence which is then the name for the idea. So we have a long, long history where people have tried to find out what the idea is until the third estate got into power and then told people that this idea cannot be known. And then, uh, so the exegesis and so on weaken and degrade the Bible in such a way that they cannot even find what the idea is in the Bible any longer. And that is what you have around here. So, therefore, all these churches are still Trinitarian down there. They say so, but the only honest Christians here are the Unitarians over there who say, we don't know what that is. So, the reason for that is that analytical understanding cannot penetrate to that point where it says the absolute is spirit or the absolute is the trinity. That means the absolute opposes itself and remains one with itself in the other, be it in the Logos, be it in creation, be it in the incarnation or whatever. This Trinitarian idea was there already in the Chinese religion of Taoism. Uh, it was there in Hinduism, the Trimurti in Hinduism, uh, and uh, it was there with the Neoplatonists and so on. So that is how it got through Alexandria into Christianity. So it was there in the New Testament. There was a father and there was a son and uh, the death of the son brought the spirit and so on. But they exegeted, uh, exegeted everything away uh, on the basis of analytical understanding. So it's a phenomenological thing that the bourgeois, the, the tool makers, they, they, they took power, the forts and so on. By the way, today they said that Ford had a wonderful policy, namely to pay his workers enough so that they could pay their own car. And don't know that Ford was a fascist. It was a wonderful fascist idea which he shared with Hitler. He did the T model here, Hitler did the Volkswagen, and he Hitler imitated his highways here. They were one heart and one soul, and he got all kinds of decorations. See, that is, we don't educate our journalists. They babble stuff there. They, each of them has 200 people behind him. We have to collect material and jokes and whatever. And all of them are equally miserably educated. And we have a school of journalism here on campus and so on. I don't know what they are doing, really. So otherwise they would either not use that for it as an example, or when they would, when they would use them, we would say, well, they were better than liberalism. They were good fascists and they were very successful. Hmm. And Hitler was able to give uh, uh, seven, six million people jobs in one year because of uh, developing Keynesianism further. The same damn it Keynesianism with which uh, President Reagan threw out <coughs> and replaced by the Friedman School and which we now have to get in again and which these super morons want to try once more to trickle it all down by cutting all the welfare programs and put all the money into this 1% who then create jobs, supposedly, and then it trickles down to everybody. That is their idea. I mean, they do have an idea. Now, idea in the weak sense now, not the real one, but, you know, some kind of one, like I would eat a hamburger now or something like some idea like this. Okay, so now the question is now that, that one keeps this tension going between the two. Now, in Christianity, something has happened, namely that this absolute idea on one side and on the other hand this empirical human being, a particular character, the rabbi, 
the Jew, the Semites, the uh, poor man, and so on, that they have become one. That means that this what is for Horkheimer and for all the critical theorists, it's, it's an antagonism. Uh, the antagonism has res been resolved in Christianity. So that means the unity of the divine and human nature. And that Horkheimer cannot accept. Even his friend uh, Tillich, Paul Tillich, the Lutheran theologian, could not believe in the divinity of Christ. That is the difficulty. So that means, the, so the, the, since uh, for Horkheimer, the Trinity was not under, understandable because he moved on the level of analytic understanding. Therefore, he functionalized it. And he said the Trinity was invented in order to reconcile Jewish ethical monotheism with Greek and uh, Roman polytheism. Or it was used in order to integrate uh, the uh, idea of Jesus and, and his person and so on, to integrate that into the strict monotheism of the Jews. So it was historically, he historically uh, um, functionalized it uh, because he, he said it uh, honestly, you know, the critical theory and the five faith idea, um, I don't know what it means. Uh, the Trinity. So he shares that with the bourgeois enlightenment. And we have to be aware that too, they are bourgeois enlightenment or Marxist enlightenment, and uh, they are different from those who became positivists, that they are critical of that enlightenment. And that is why then Fromm was quoted by the popes, and, and that's why Horkheimer and uh, Adorno were uh, quoted by the last pope in spite of the fact that the popes usually only quote themselves. So it's an astonishing thing. That means these religious people uh, reach out to enlighteners who at the same time know of the dialectics of enlightenment, that enlightenment can turn over into its opposite, that enlightenment can uh, uh, promise people to free them from their fears and to make them into masters of their faith and at the same time increase their fears through their bombardments and whatever and also make them more dependent which is funny, funny as it is the argument of the 1% that Omar makes you know, 49% dependent on the state and, and so on so, or when you have another definition of enlightenment the Freudian one where it is ego should be the bourgeoisie then leads into a position with C.K. Jung and so on where, where ego is, it is again, and that is why Sigi Jung became a fascist, and so on. Okay, so I'm, I emphasize that and trauma on it uh, because it is so decisive now for all what you experience around you, and so on. If you, um, on, if you can hold on or can carry through that tremendous antagonism between that sense of reality on one side, so that you see uh, with the family, the failed state and failed families and so on but on the other hand you can stubbornly hold on to this idea and not give it up no matter what happens and in spite of the fact that if you are not a Christian you cannot get those two things together and um, it is not only that, to get those two things together means that uh, redemption has happened already Christians may say and a little bit milder and say well, uh, it has happened and not yet happened, which is a strange dialectic sense, which they usually don't use dialectics. So, um, but in reality, what we see on television is that there is no redemption. This is a totally unredeemed type of a society, and so it is with everybody else. If they would be redeemed, they would stop lying. If they would be redeemed, they would stop murdering. If they would be redeemed, they would not, not steal with Wall Street, they would not murder with the Pentagon, and they would not lie with the White House. So, therefore, it is totally unredeemed. So, what, what they say is that people who go to church there, that they somehow have this assertion that we are redeemed already, and that is somewhat fate, that is our fate to be redeemed already, and that nothing new has to be expected anymore. That is the reason why those creatures send boy for Bush. When, why, why you have masses of Christians, uh, Catholics and, and Evangelicals, joining the most murderous uh, conservative groups. And, and this will be the next election, the next election. The, uh, after this uh, triumphant thing, they're voting in Bush twice, 
the Catholics and the Evangelicals have a, made a contract with each other that they will continue this beautiful, successful uh, thing. That would not be possible if they were redeemed. And that is the fundamental lie, that they say they are redeemed and they are not. And behind that, there is, of course, the Jewish thing for which the Jews had to die all the time. And that is, the Jews had many messiahs. And so Jesus was believed by some people to be the Messiah. And so the, uh, uh, what, what they do, what the Jews do, is when the Messiah dies and he doesn't keep his promise and the realm of peace does not come and justice does not come and things just get worse and so on, then the Jews say it was a false alarm. So they had one false alarm after the other. The guy who in 134, Bar Kokhba, upheaval, the last attack of the Jews against the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire wiped them out, and the rest of them committed suicide on this mountain. What is it called? Masada. Masada, yeah, right. So um, that was in 134. In the 70s, they had already been slaughtered, and they marched, out, or marched into Jerusalem and so on, and then, uh, but they finished them up completely in 134 or so. So he was declared, you know, by the famous rabbis in, in, among the Jews who said, this is the Messiah. This is the Bar Kokhba is the Messiah. And then when he was slaughtered, then he said, well, it was a false alarm, you know. And then um, Sabbat Hesri, you know, was another one at the end of the Middle Ages. And uh, he was also, everybody said, all the Jews said, he is the Messiah. He has come and said, what does he do? He converts in uh, Constantinople, he converts to a uh, uh, um, to, to Islam and uh, then the Jews split millions of them became Roman Catholic at that time and uh, others uh, developed a strange new development namely that the Messiah uh, also sins that means that the best way to overcome sin is to sin and then you have this strange character Rasputin mm -hmm. a monk uh, not a real priest but a monk who uh, beggar monk who went through village to village and preached exactly that message and he also practiced it by sleeping with all the little village girls there and uh, the more they sinned the more they were redeemed and then unfortunately he also slept with the noble woman women in, uh, in Moscow, he did not sleep with the Sarina but healing her son who had a blood disease uh, or she thought he healed gave him a tremendous influence uh, in the court of the of uh, Nicholas the last uh, Tsar, uh, unbelievably tragic type of a of a figure, and uh, so you have this movie there, Doctor Zhivago, I think there, but other movies too. When we go to Yalta, there that was his palace, and five years before he was executed by the socialists, he still went to occasions there, so he's very close. And now um, Putin and so on, they have taken some of his bones from the Oral, uh, bordering Siberia, where they executed him and have put it in the, in the cathedral in, in uh, St. Petersburg, and he has been made a saint and whatever, so they, they're strange. And that is what the positivists then call a return uh, to religion, which you can only have if you have no idea. That means the idea which we just discussed. If that is completely missing, then you have no criterion if religion really returned, or if it didn't return, you don't even know what it is. Okay, now these are some harsh people, uh, harsh things there, but uh, in, uh, I'm not here to, to convert you or whatever, but our task is simply to uh, see and, and portray as honestly as we can what the position is. So that is the Jewish position, to see reality as brutal as it is possible, at the same time to hold on to the idea to which the reality continually contradicts. And that can be very personal. You can be a very pious person and then you die from cancer. Or you are jobless. Or your marriage collapses and so on. And you do not deserve it at all. It is an unbelievable injustice which happens to you. But you do not... Uh, by the way, the trial of God in, uh, in, in, in Auschwitz shows that very uh, good. The Wiesel, the Jewish poet who wrote the piece The Night um, reports that that the rabbis and some intellectuals in Auschwitz who were ready for it to be asked that they put God on trial and it lasted for three days and we have a movie if you want to we could show some of it 
and um, you know, long discussion, and there was a prosecutor who prosecuted God, and then there was defense of God too, and it went on back and forth, and then the court ended, and God was found guilty. But the interesting thing is that um, that the rabbis usually request. Uh, most of the people then did not pray any longer if they were gassed or not. And Israel today is 80% profane, is, uh, don't believe anything anymore. Uh, so, but what is also true, and that is emphasized by all pious people, some of them, after God was found guilty, put their hand on their head, which is a sign of, uh, of devotion to God and submission in the Islamic sense, and no matter what, that gesture shows you what is meant by, by Horkheimer. Everything in the reality where they found themselves, the gas and the SS and so on, was in utter opposition to the idea. But they held on to the idea in the gesture of putting their hand on their head and marching into the gas chamber. That is Judaism. And that is idealism. And that is the critical theory. What is dangerous or what is makes it difficult is that in our American mind and brain we are, have a hard time to hold two opposite things together. And then in Christianity, as we said, they collapsed the, the antagonism by simply asserting that the two have been reconciled in Jesus the Christ, in the Messiah, in the Son of Man, as Daniel prophesied it, and so on and that the redemption has happened already. So um, that, uh, uh, that may be explain what, what the difference is and why then the, uh, while that was sealed not only by the uh, idealists, which would be Hegel and Schelling and Fichte and Hegel, um, but also by their followers, namely by Marx himself. And so we, we, they teach Marx a little bit or they talk about him together with Weber and so on in the sociology department, there we have to see that Marx had this idea as well. So that is where Horkheimer then talks about proletarian idealism. Proletarian idealism, that is what it meant. So instead of historical materialism, proletarian idealism, because Marx could not have uh, done his own experiment without the idea, because um, how else should you know what is wrong? Uh, for Marx, uh, civil society, uh, capitalist society was sick. So there was the pathology. But how do you know what is pathological or not if you don't know what is sound and what is right and so on? So the whole thing with the opiate, we discussed that enough there. Um, the idea from Kant, you know, opium religion, and then Hegel, opium religion, Hinduism and that is where, um, where uh, Marx got it from. So, Marx does not attack Jesus, the carpenter whom he introduced to his children, the poor man whom the rich people murdered, and so on. So, Nietzsche attacks Jesus himself because of his slave morality, and so on. So, that is a serious thing. But Marx never attacks Jesus himself. He attacks the Christians who betray him. He attacks the bourgeois religion. That's all the religion you have downtown. The bourgeois religion is opium religion. What does that mean? It makes people feel good and it dulls their conscience so that here they live side by side with the north side on the other side of the railroad station and have a completely good conscience to live in their big homes which the police watched and so on and live their good life and then send maybe a, a little basket on Christmas or whatever on the other side or let some priests do you know, little charity work and so on and they then live with their good conscience. So that is opium religion. And uh, Metz and so on, these are the liberation theologians, they want to get beyond that opium religion. But uh, so it comes from Kant that when you die and you call the priest or imam or whatever, um, what the imam should do is not to make you feel good now, but he should stimulate your conscience. If you can still make something good, what you messed up in your crazy life, and uh, if uh, or if there's at this moment still you can still do something good, that is important. That by the right wing is now, and I think we talked discussed that priest here who did that and condemned Kant and so on because Kant uh, emphasized the conscience. They want to have a bourgeois religion without any conscience. So 
so that they can kill one million Iraqis and feel good at the same time. Or that they kill thousands of people in Afghanistan and in Pakistan every day, I mean, with these bombers there, uh, and, and, and feel good at this. Or feel nothing at the whole thing. That is it. So that is the evil type of thing. And to see that a positivistic study of religion does not help because it leaves out the objective side, the idea. It's idealist and therefore cannot understand it at all. Uh, when you say a sentence, you know, that a religion could mobilize its uh, humanistic potential and its conscience and could make people critical, they don't know what the hell you are talking about. When they say there is a religion, uh, and we saw the, uh, a return to religion, we saw that in Sebastopol. In Sebastopol, this is a city now, which is now part of the Crimea and it's part of Russia now, <laughs> there, there were some communists there, old ladies and so on, and they went to the cathedral, which the Germans, by the way, had shot to pieces with one cannon, a uh, huge cannon which they brought all the way from Berlin, um, and uh, so they put a little candle up there, and that they called then return to religion, or that they make this poor Nicholas there into a saint that they call return to religion, it has nothing to do with return to religion. So the, it is it, very important now if you uh, still have an inkling of what was once called the idea or not. And now for Hegel that goes of course into more detail, sociological detail, because there is not only the all-embracing idea, but also the idea of the family, or the idea of civil society, or the idea of uh, the state, or of uh, history and so on. When Marx said the state will wither away, then it is the state which is not functionalized by this 1%, by the Koch brothers, for instance. The Koch brothers, why do they say coach brothers all the time? Mm. They're two damaged Germans, the Koch brothers, who give billions of dollars to away for, for, for all these propaganda things, which you see there. I lost all my pension, and so on. This uh, Obamacare or whatever, that comes all from them. So that means they instrumentalize, they want to have their people there so that the state does their thing. That is the instrumentalization. But there's not only a bourgeois instrumentalization of the state, but there is also a proletarian instrumentalization because the struggle, according to Marx, is to take that power out of the Koch brothers and give it to the, to the proletarians. So that means what somebody said just a few minutes ago, uh, we have socialism for the rich and we have a brutal capitalism for the poor. So that means that the 99% in this country do the same thing what the bourgeoisie did before, namely to instrumentalize the state in order to es establish uh, uh, justice. Until the state then is not necessary anymore, so if there are no classes anymore, then this abuse of the state is not possible, it's not necessary anymore. But the state may be necessary, but the state in a real sense, namely the state as the community or the association of the free members of the free citizens who in discourse with each other decide their fate uh, with each other, and so on, which the state is now not, because you see most Americans say the government, so that means they don't even get the state in, in its totality, and then this government is something hostile, it takes the taxes away from them, and now they introduce Obamacare, and then they hate it, and so on, and so on. So th that, it, that means if you abuse the state, no matter how little people know about political science or whatever, they know it's the enemy. But they don't know exactly why the state is their enemy. The state is their enemy because it is used as an instrument by the 1% against the 99%, by the few in order to control the many. That is why it's hated. And when the same thing is done with religion, then people also hate religion. And I see that all the time, but people hate Christianity, they hate, religion, they hate everything, and so on. That, that's okay, but they should at least find out and analyze why they hate it now and what has happened to it. So. Nevertheless, but as far as Marx is concerned, he is still to some extent Aristotelian. He still has this idea of a metaphysical truth. Truth that means not only that there is the absolute truth, but that there is also relative truth. That means that a family can either be identical with itself or it can contradict itself. It can be a failed type of a family. And so Hegel makes clear what the idea or the notion, which is the same thing, the notion of the family is, namely marriage based on love and the 
poverty, the house, the car, and so on, and then the education of the children. And you can see, look at the movies, for instance, how they reflect the family. See, everybody loves uh, Raymond. Everybody loves Raymond. <laughs> you have one of these innumerable family movies there. And see what's going on there. Uh, it reflects you know, the, the, the absurdity of what is family. So there is almost nothing about education of children, except that the little creeps are running around and, and uh, destroy everything. Um, and, and the most trouble is between the married partners and their father-in-law and mother-in-law or whatever. And a horrible chaos in which the idea does not even appear anymore. Except it appears in the negative. That means it appears in its negation. And the negation is made into a joke. It's a jokey negation or whatever. And then everybody can laugh about it, which, by the way, is a nice way to deal with catastrophes, if you can somehow laugh them away or so. And so the same thing happens with the state, the same thing happens with civil society and so on. So Marx could, without the idea, Marx could not even have seen that something is wrong. What's wrong with having the slums there? What's wrong with something they deserve to be in the slums? Because the damn lazy sit on television all the time and wait for the, for the uh, health insurance or whatever. So... Uh, Therefore, um, now what the name is, Marx does not give a name to the idea, but uh, it is possible that he was a Spinozist, that means followed Spinoza, that he had a pantheistic type of an idea about what, uh, what the idea may be. That means the all-embracing that uh, nature and God are identical. So, uh, natura sive deus, uh, God and na nature are the same. Um, and uh, that was sometimes called atheism. But if you want to call it a nice name, then you would call it pantheism. Again, it sounded a little bit religious still. So, Okay, so that was our point today, and now we can go into more concrete things, very really detailed things. But we should not forget the, um, uh, the, the uh, by looking at the trees, we should not forget the, the forest, right? So the fourth is this antagonism between reality, as we see it, in all its brutality on one side, and the idea to which one holds on in spite of the fact that the reality opposes it. Things are not as they ought to be. And then you can say, let them, let them make as they are. Or, and there you have the, uh, uh, the whole issue of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam and the, the rise of mysticism because that redemption which was promised the Messiah did not come. So that means the parousia delay. And uh, for Horkheimer and others it may not even be d a delay. Or they may say, well, uh, I'm afraid it will not come. Or I hope it will come. I hope the Christians are right but that they say it has happened already, that is a fundamental lie. Um, so it hasn't happened. Uh, I'm afraid it will not happen. I hope it may happen. So that the uh, universal despair in which we find ourselves, that this will not be the last word, that the murderer will not triumph over the innocent victim, that Bush will not triumph over the one million who are laying the sand now, whom he <coughs> found and killed and murdered and so on so that this will not be the last word, that would be horrifying. And then where the church, you know, churches and so on, uh, making people uh, feel good in the face of all that, or say you have some sects who sing all the time, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, and so on, in spite of the fact that they live in the most miserable circumstances, they are conditioned like little dogs to sing, to sing. Uh, it's all right, it's all right, it's right, and, and the critical theory is do not sing, it's all right, because it is not all right, and the redemption has not happened, and so on. And then there are Christians like Tillich who would say the same thing. So that does not mean that they do not think highly about it. Uh, they would say that all these martyrs like Kennedy and uh, Malcolm X and so on, that fundamentally they all followed the example of the poor carpenter who was murdered by the, uh, by the witch and so on and that the good people in, in this society you will always have the, the worst part of it and, and so on so that uh, bad, peop bad things are happening to good people all the time <coughs> and that is where this whole reality is in utter uh, contradiction to the idea and what they charge 
Catholicism with and more Protestantism that they identified somehow with the idea with that what is empirically happening uh, and thereby justify it. That is the big charge. So, little Catholic story, uh, the, uh, Napoleon uh, uh, tracked the Pope, took the Pope prisoners and tracked him over the Alps and then took him to Notre Dame for his own coronation. And when the old man had the crown in his hand, he took it out of his hand and put it on his own head and, and so on. So then the Catholics said, well, and then he marched to Russia and there, you know, the, the, the city was burned down, Moscow, and he lost and he had to run back and so on. That was the punishment of God and so on. So that means that would be to justify the horrible things which happen by the idea. To make the idea into an ideology, right? Then it becomes false consciousness, it becomes the masking of class interests and uh, race interests and national interests and so on. And that is when uh, religion becomes most dangerous. Therefore, Marx said, first we have to get rid of the critique of religion, then we can get to the, to the critique of the profane conditions which that religion legitimates. And so that means the bourgeoisie, by saying this, Marx, you know, it says opium for the people and so on, uh, and therefore he's a bad guy. What he says is what you did with Christianity, the betrayal of Jesus, that is the opium, that is what has to go not that carpenter there. So he told his children, you know who Jesus was, and so on. And the children said later on that um, he made sure that they would never uh, fall for the fraud which is preached from the pulpits. By the way, not necessarily in the music. The music of the churches may be the most honest part of it. And you think of Johann Sebastian Bach, for instance, the only composer of Baroque. Baroque was a Catholic movement but there was one Protestant who was in it, and that was Johann Sebastian Bach. And you see the Matthew Passion play, then Adorno would say, that cannot be entirely untrue. That cannot be entirely untrue. So careful you have to be. What you hear in the church is entirely untrue. But what you can see when you see, you know, some martyrs, or some, like Romeo or whatever, then they would say, this can not be entirely untrue. So you have a double negation there. It's a very negative approach to it, a very careful, because the enslavement of people by this swindle is just unbelievable. And people are like in Plato's cave. You know, they sit and look at the wall and they see the shadows going by the images, television images and so on. And nobody turns their neck around. Their neck is stuck and nobody comes in order to put the neck around so that they can look to the opening and can see the real trees which then in the sunlight shine into their eyes. And this sunlight, that is the idea. So that is what the Persians call Aura Mazda. And that is what the Muslims call Allah. And that is what the Jews call uh, the uh, um, Yahweh and what Jesus called Yahweh and, and Father and so on. So that, uh, and positivism means that you lose all that. Then you only study that what is um, at hand, what is the case without any light whatsoever. And then quantify it, you know, you can count how many Methodists there are, many Catholics, that's all very interesting. I mean, it's, 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 the, the work which, uh, uh, sampling for instance in statistics, you know, you cannot do it better. These computers there, they're all com uh, produced by high school dropouts and so on, on the lowest <coughs> level of, uh, of, uh, of the logic, but they are still masterpieces. They're still admirable uh, machines, how they developed all the right. So, and uh, that is what, what I try to make clear to Katya, you know, that in the Communist Manifesto, you have a whole chapter on the greatness of the bourgeoisie. So you must never forget this, you know, when we are critical that you see at the same time what they have produced, they were in order to lost airliner now, they don't find it, but all the machines which they bring in there in order to go 3,000 feet deep, the Indian Ocean there, they are the Alps, the Alps are underneath there. That means there are mountains underneath there which are as high as the Himalaya and so on. And they have machines and they have little U-boats and so on, they can crawl everywhere and so on. So they have done unbelievable things. So that is admirable. But then it has 
a satanic site. And that from the very beginning, namely Odysseus. And we talked that, uh, you know, Odysseus is the first bourgeois, Bush is the last one. Unfortunately, uh, Cheney is not the last one. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid there will be a few more coming before the upright finally. But you have it already in the nutshell there. <coughs> and I don't want to repeat that again, where you have this type coming up there who has no real respect for the, uh, for the gods who is agnostic and who depends continue, uh, on, on his uh, tricks there, diggy trick, trick guy there. Um, ten years of war uh, and Agamemnon and all the heroes are fighting against each other in Troy at the Black Sea, not too far away from the Crimea, and, uh, and, and cannot uh, get the city under their, their beleaguered and cannot break through. And then comes the no bourgeois, breaking out of the mythological age and looking with, uh, with a keen sense of reality, as we call that, with a brutality, demythologized, de-enchantized, and so on. And uh, like a businessman, he looks now what these needs uh, are of these Trojans, and he finds out what their psychology is, market psychology, like they use Freud here and so on, in order to dupe the masses of the people. So he uh, then uh, finds out they are very, very curious, very curious, and so he invents that horse, the Trojan horse, and puts the Greeks in, soldiers in, and puts it in the moonshine. And he can predict market research, you know, he can predict what they will do. They cannot let that horse stand there. They have to bring it in, and they are tired, they have to look at it next morning, and so on. So it stands on the marketplace in Troy, and then they sneak out in the moonshine and open up the doors, and the Greek army marches in. That is a new age. That is the age of the bourgeois. But then he sails home to Ithaca, <laughs> wants to sail home, but he has violated the laws of Poseidon. He you see the attitude of the bourgeois towards religion. Um, he was hungry, so to hell with sacred cows and so on, so he eats them all. That's why most of his friends ate them. And so Poseidon then gets angry and, uh, and stirs up a storm over the Mediterranean. And of course, this early bourgeois didn't have a compass yet. Later on, the bourgeoisie invents all these things. That is their great accomplishment. So he's flown in the middle of the Mediterranean and doesn't know where the hell he is anymore. And then he comes to that island, and then how the bourgeois deals primitive people, you know, those underdeveloped people, undeveloped people, whom they manipulate to the World Bank and to the, uh, the uh, uh, financial operations and so on. So, uh, and, and there you see again how he deals with them. See, he's, he's, he's primitive. He has only one eye. See, the Greek mythology is unbelievably intelligent. You know, the, the Germanic doesn't even come close to it. So um, he has only one eye as a sign of his primitivity and differentiatedness, uh, evolutionist differentiation. So uh, then uh, um, he catches them now. He's with his group in the cave. They have eaten his food. He goes up the cave with a big stone. They cannot get out. And now he sits there. And now he starts again with cunning. Cunning is the characteristics of the bourgeois. So he cunningly, he says, what needs does he have? The guy is so stupid, he doesn't have any. So therefore we have to make one. And so he sees some grapes. He tramples on the grapes with his people. They make wine, they give him wine. He never had it. Now this need is produced. He needs more and more. And then lays down and sleeps and snores. And then comes Odysseus and takes a stick, long stick, puts it in the fire, and then puts it in the one eye he has, and he turns it around the sadism of the bourgeois, the sadistic toward the little guys to the smaller one to the Saddam Hussein and, and so on and so on, the little guys and so on, just uh, and at the same time a masochism against the uh, against the people who are more powerful. Uh the Odysseus is called the much suffering Odysseus. So the bourgeois is hard in giving, has a tremendous joy in sadism and at the same time also can be masochistic. That means he enjoys the suffering too. And we have that in Hitler too. On one side, all these minorities where he tortures them and so on, and he sees the officers who are hanged up there, he sees movies at night. That's the bourgeois sadism. So it's in the lower bourgeoisie mm -hmm. as much as in the higher bourgeoisie. And then, but also, you know, and he says fate wanted it that way, that the Russians are here and so on. So then he's also willing to suffer the consequences and, and so on. So, and so the guy now, you know, cannot see anything. And so 
Malchum, no, Odysseus binds his friends under the goats there, and they carry them out. He can only touch the animals from on the back, so he cannot feel them. And so he gets under the strongest <coughs> animal, and the trick, tricky, cunning guy gets all his friends out in the open, but that doesn't end the sadism. There he uh, goes back to the ship, and then he shouts into the mountain and says, an eagle, and the giant throws stones, but in the wrong direction, uh, where the ego comes from, and so he sits on the ship down and enjoys how this poor blinded guy now throws stones all over the place and doesn't hit anybody. Ha 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 ha! There's the laughter which you also have on on television there all the time about the jokes and so on. So uh, uh, so then then he goes to an island where matriarchy is still dominant and where the church uh, has these men. He, she ch- changed them all into um, into pigs and. The whole island is full of pigs, and so again he uses the cunning. He knows the, the buttons to push it in order to turn a woman around and to make her love him, and, and so on. And so she does love him. She uh, he forces her to transform the pigs into human beings again, and that becomes the group which take him to Ithaca. She gives him a ship, he even puts everything on it, and then he comes to Ithaca, and nobody knows where it is. According to the whole Yugoslav, on a Dalmatian coast, uh, everybody says this is Ithaca. But he comes home, and for ten years the the people there uh, wooed uh, his wife and wanted to marry her, and she had that trick there. She had a little thing which she was weaving, and she said, "When this is finished, then I'll marry some of you." And but then he she dissolves it every night, and so in the morning she starts in the beginning again. So for ten years <coughs> she takes them away, but they eat everything. What what uh, what uh, desire is that? And so he masks himself, he uh, gets uh, in contact with his son and with the old servant, and then he butchers each of these sewers, their suitors, uh, uh, day after day, and so on in the most cruel way. There you see the bourgeois in his whole totality, and Cheney is that, the last stage of this abominable type of thing. But not only abominable, he has really changed the face of the earth. Uh, by his steamboats, by his uh, technology, by his science, and so on, but without the idea. He lost the idea in the process and moves around like a blind tornado all over the place. So, uh, nevertheless, this was our theme, it's the theme tonight, and whatever we do from the last two hours or so, that we keep that in mind there, you know, what, uh, what, the, uh, what Judaism stands for, what um, what the idealists stand for, and that we don't have this idiotic or romantic or whatever idea of an idealist. What the idealist is is not somebody who cannot see uh, what the reality is. You know, so they say to uh, to Carter, he's naive. You know, he was naive with the Iranians and so on. And now they say say to Obama, he was naive. He doesn't know who Putin is. You know, he's naive. Whether he wants to talk with the Syrians, of course he can talk with them. You have to bomb the the, the uh, Iranians, you know, and so on. You have to like, um, like we gave them gas against the Iranians, the Iraqis, or whatever. That's what you have to do with them, and so on. So um, that uh, charge of naivete that is directed against the idealist or against the Christian or against the Jew or whatever, that somebody wants to talk and he thinks that through talk he can reach something. That is naive. That's a naive idealist. And that is what people usually have in their mind, what the realists have in mind when they talk about idealism. It's a naive guy, and it's dangerous. He's dangerous because he produces a situation in which we are seen to be weak, and therefore Putin can do what he wants to because we look weak, and so on. And then you have to take revenge, of course, all the time for whatever they do. But the Iranians did something horrible, a horrible thing yesterday. Does anybody remember what they did? The Iranians took the guy who took our people in the consulate prisoner, the Revolutionary Guard, he was the leader, and made him into the ambassador at the UN. <laughs> <laughs> now, they have, to give him, they have to give him a visa to travel to New York. I mean, sometimes it is just outrageous. And I, I don't know what the imams say, <laughs> what they think. If they maybe they had forgotten it, or maybe they thought we had forgotten it. Usually, forget everything. How they suddenly can go to their library and get, know 
who that guy was and that this is the guy who will be the Iranian ambassador to the UN now. So he will come in a few days. And I think they have no choice, you know, than to, I mean, according to international law, they cannot deny him, cannot deny him this passport or whatever he needs. So he will sleep in a hotel in New York. He can be happy if they don't hang him or shoot him or whatever, but they probably will not do that. They, they have to just, to, 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 you know, the, what is it called? To, what you do with your teeth when you are in hell, you are gnashing the teeth. You your teeth. <laughs> so, but that is again an opportunity, you know, where the, all these war mongers, you know, and Cheney and, and the head of it, he is the, the super leader of, of all these uh, guys, um, where they say, well, this is what happens to the idealism, you know, this is what you, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter if you are a Christian or whatever idealist, or liberal, you know, bleeding heart liberal and so on. You give the impression of weakness and that makes the others, you know, trample on you, and so then he took he took the Crimea, and so he didn't take the Crimea. They all make it up. So uh, that uh, and, and that is pathology, right? Now we have it, pathology. We can say that this is pathology, but we can say that only when we have the idea that, in spite of all that, what is so wrong and so sick. But you cannot even say that it's see that it's sick. You know that is the fatal type of a thing, because most Americans still think that it's all normal, or they may even think that Cheney is right or whatever. You know this is the depth of the night in which we find ourselves. And uh, so, but that one sees this doesn't mean that you have to commit suicide or whatever. But instead of that, the Jews and the idealists they hold on to this idea no matter what. So one thing one cannot say that somebody who does does that is then not seeing the real thing, you know. I mean that the Iranians, you know, uh, are different parties among them and they are one of them are open and others more closed up and so on. So one has to analyze that and could a theorist, idealist or Jew has no problem to analyze this all, but if you do that analysis with light or in utter darkness, that makes a great difference. Okay, do we have anything about this? Uh, would you like to uh, ask another question or that I explain something? Um, I think it has to be explained many times because it avoids us again as soon as we go outside into the real world, right? which reconditions us in case somebody broke out of the conditioning. Should we take a break for a little bit? Yes, we, yes, we can do that. Presentations yes. that have to... Yeah, have then to we have the presentation, all right? All right. Very good. So before we do that, let me just say the little things which I have here, then I have that behind me there. Um, and we ha want to see what movie we want to... I think we have enough of the Hitler movies. We want to come to our present. And we have this uh, other people's money. Maybe we can see a scene <laughs> of that uh, to uh, uh, to see, you know, the capitalist system, and then to something about um, about our more more movie there that we come into our present um, and leave fascism behind and look at liberalism, what it looks like in the moment. Okay, but a few few announcements which I want to make, which I have made before, but I just want to see that everybody is on board. So, um, yeah, here it is. So, that is uh, 12 today. So, the test, do I have all the tests? Do you do I have a test from you too, everybody? Yeah, okay. Very good. Okay, so I have all the tests now, and um, and I can give them back then oh, afterwards, or I can give them back the next time. So, then um, presentation we want to have today. Uh, after we have a break there. Um, the last class is on April 9, right? So we have two more classes. Bring out all the questions you have that will count for your all participation and so on. Rudy, April 9th is next week. Hmm? April 9th is next week. Oh, 16th. So, oh, and, uh, so next week is the 9th, and then the 16th is the last one. Good, okay. And then um, we have an excursion to St. Gregory's Abbey. I take the people always to religious communities, even when they are online. They go to religious communities in Chicago, in Detroit, everywhere. It's unbelievable interesting. But they come, uh, it's a class on 
religion and social ethics, and they discuss with the priest or minister or rabbi or whatever. Some of them haven't been in the religious community for 20 years. And uh, the, it's amazing, you know, America, religious country or whatever, there are people who never in their life have ever been in a sacred space or whatever. So that is a quite a great experience there. Nevertheless, if anybody's interested, on Tuesday we go to the uh, to the monks there. Uh, we have a round table thing. You are invited to that too. For Saturday, 12:30, always at the Colonial Kitchen there. Dustin is there. David is there, and we have some people there. You are all very much invited. You get some of your tuition back there. <laughs> Summer one, uh, there is. I have this class there. That's of course, in the 300 level, psychology of religion, but if you know somebody who's interested, you know, we mentioned right it online, then for there, the two courses we had, uh, um, people, a person came, a publisher came from Minneapolis, and um, they want to have about this one course, Religion and Revolution, they want to have a text uh, a book made out of it, and I told them I cannot do it immediately, but in the long run, I never wanted to do uh, these text there before, but uh, we'll see, I may do it, and they want to have the others too, maybe, so uh, a book for every syllabus there, I don't know exactly when I should do all this, that's you have to help, so Man. okay, yeah, so, so this is in the fall, you know, if anybody's interested in <coughs> Zoom, you know somebody who's interested uh, then you can tell them then the contemporary issues, we have some, and we can do that later we don't have to do it today uh, the reading, background reading, was Horkheimer's book there, and what I said today, that is somewhat also present in this Horkheimer book, the Critical Sociology of Religion, and then if you <coughs> cannot find that, then there is the uh, word religion in the public sphere, which is a book from India that should be in the bookstore, so, so that would be our last, the third background reading, and then the third, third diff study, you can connect that with your presentation, so you can make a presentation however much or whatever and you can take that as a depth study as well and then um, that was our point today right the issue the sense for reality and at the same time the adherence to the idea as we try to explain it uh, okay so uh, then we have uh, uh, this this uh, this uh, yeah. okay uh, and then the movie, and maybe we take today, we take that other people's money, um, which is, uh, you know, about the price of capitalist existence. Okay? Very good. you got a lot of writing to do. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly how he found us. Yeah. And I didn't ask him really how he found us. He didn't know my website, so he could have found it on the website, but he didn't have the website. I gave it to him. Yeah. Does he? I mean, does he want some kind of theoretical analysis of different revolutions in the religious well, aspect? Well, that's what I want to see. I, you know, he wants to sell it in the universities, or so I think that's it's a. Um, what is it called? To this, you know, this no normal textbook. Textbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wants to have a textbook. Yeah. But I have to see what that looks like, a uh, textbook in his sense, you know. Right, right. You'd have to find out. I, I've got a really good book called Revolutions and Revolutionaries. Yeah. And it goes through all the different revolutions, yeah. I think, since the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. But it always, it lacks the religious component, yeah. unless it's a revolution, right. like the Iranian yeah, yeah, one or right. something. So well, I mean, even the title is wrong. The title is, um, it says, I think, it's the revolution in religion or whatever. So much my title is really like religion and revolution. Right. Yeah. yeah. Not revolution in religion. Well, it's right. right. so, so like Nevertheless, I will see, time. he gives me a template, and I see if one can fit it in there. Like, I do it online. Yeah, really good job I have to squeeze so it in there, you know, and see if one gets something through or not. By the way, did you yeah, ever show me a book of Marcuse yeah. on religion? Right now, oh, yeah. I don't know. In you, a way, we asked about that last time. I have to go and check. Precise or whatever. I have. In somebody did. Way, Walter like did. What I had it in my hands. Yeah. It's so dry. Maybe I took it home. Maybe not. Maybe I told you or the other to order it for me or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I can't find it anymore. Okay. It so has see just evaporated. I'll see what I can find. But I have it very clear. It says Marcuse on religion. Because it was so amazing. He's yeah, the he most, didn't write much on religion. most secular one of all of them. You right, know? right. There was a 
amazed that uh, this exists, but it does exist. I in have English. it in my hands. In English? Mm hmm. Okay. I'll see if I can, what I can do if I can and find and it. One of you brought it to the, uh, to the, to the f uh, um, place there. To the lunch? Yeah, Colonial Kitchen. I'm actually not going to be there this Saturday because I'll be at the AAR okay. in Ohio. Uh, who can take me there? Can we um, call Walter? I can see if Walter can. Yeah. He'll most likely say no. Uh. <laughs> who else is there? Steven Cartier. I can. You can? For sure. So, okay. Maybe you want to do that. I can drive over here. You can? No big deal. Okay. Sure. I need somebody to come along there. From Luther to Popper? Not that one, no? No. no. Study some critical thoughts. Mm -hmm. I'll scour the world, see what I can yeah. find. Strange. I sent an email to Rome trying to get a book called uh, Le Slam Revolutionnaire. Mm -hmm. French book. And the only place I can find it. It was published in Germany, but the only place mm -hmm. I can find it is in Rome. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they could hold on to a copy of it. Um, till I get there, yeah. and they said, "No, no, we're only an online store." But it was written by Carlos the Jackal. Oh. You remember Carlos? Yeah. <laughs> like uh -huh. the world's original terrorist. Yeah. From Venezuela. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Right. And he was a Marxist, and then eventually, I think he was hiding in Sudan from the uh -huh. French authorities, and he converted to Islam. Uh -huh. And then he's like trying to say that Marxism is a dead tradition. But the only thing I can fight against capitalism effectively is Islam. Yeah. Therefore, he's like begging, not mm. really begging, but he's encouraging Marxists and leftists to mm. embrace Islam to fight against capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. It's the most fascinating thing. And it was published in like 2003 in French. And so mm. I have a translator who, if I can get the, the publisher's permission, mm. will have it translated into English. Yeah, yeah that would be good. Carlos is no idiot either. I mean, yeah. he was, I mean, really smart. He studied in mosque. You know, I found out uh, in uh, I took him to the mosque and they built that mosque. You know, and they said they saved all the money. Sure. They didn't go to the bank. They didn't take a loan. Mm -hmm. That means they can get around the usury laws. Right. No that riba. Was, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. That was that interesting. They do it really, and we have a professor on campus too who teaches that mm -hmm. in economics. Islamic banking laws. Yeah. Absolutely. So you can get uh, Islamic mortgages in in like Britain and things like that. Yeah. You know, they've got a lot of these mortgages where they don't they don't pay like you don't pay interest. You might have to pay some kind of fee or something like yeah. that. So they uh, change that the be. language. Yeah. The, what they usually do, like in back home, they tell you like um, let's say I'm uh, Hadid, like a metal, a metal or something. Mm -hmm. Like when they sell it in the uh, open market, like how much you get, like uh, right. they will, yeah, they will buy it like for 120. I mean, they may they may sell it like for 110, uh -huh. and they they you got like 110. Right, right. And so it's a that's that's actually, yeah, what they usually do. Yeah, like they, they should like you are not supposed like to give them money like currency and you bring them back currency. Right. It's supposed to be like different uh, something. Right. So something different. Yeah, like cars, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. muscles, mm -hmm. I <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Okay, let's start. Very good. All right. So I guess I got the presentation tonight. Uh, Who is the next one? Who will do the next? We have two two uh, days more, so I can do it. Have next to time. Okay, next time. Do we have time for everybody? How many more do we have? Wait, not today. But yeah, not after today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we have two next week, and then we have two more, right? Yep. So on the last week. Yep. Very good. Okay, we have settled it. Very good. Uh, so for my last uh, death study and presentation here, I focused on Eric Rome's on disobedience. Okay. Um, I was struck uh, reading at the in the beginning of the semester, um, especially for the first exam, I was kind of struck by Eric Rome, and I, I liked his uh, being an activist as well as an academic, as he was very involved in the anti-war movement and the anti-nuclear movement. So I was, I was struck by that, so I focused on this book. Um, there's a couple major themes which run through it, uh, the first of which is humanism. Uh, he places a, a large value on being humanistic 
and showing how it's important to uh, you know to value human life and not get bogged down with uh, you know, the material aspects or just the psychoanalytical things, but focusing you know not losing sight of the human as the, the goal of, of research and as the basis of society. Uh, he talks, uh, so he, he brings that kind of throughout the entire discussion. Uh, and he brings in and demonstrates, uh, and this is what I, I found most interesting, well, one of the things that was interesting, was, you know, we talked a lot about him combining Freud and Marx, but um, this kind of offered kind of a, a specific way in which he did that. So, for example, he discusses uh, the relationship between the economic basis of society and the ideas that come out of it. Right? This very Marxist uh, ideal that it, uh, you know, the way that you know, cap is it capitalism is a communism, and how does that influence uh, the ideas and the ideals which individuals hold? But he says there's an intermediate step there, kind of drawing off of Freud and talking about the social character. Let's see. So. Uh, there's a couple of uh, really good quotes. One of them, for instance, uh, he says, social change and revolution are caused not only by uh, produ productive forces which conflict with one another uh, with older forms or social organizations, but also by the conflict between inhuman social conditions and unalterable human needs. So he draws on Freud in saying that there are these you know, deep-seated needs within humans, and these often come in conflict with those things which are going on in the larger society, whether it's the you know, capitalist structure or the socialist structure, these things might be needing or might be meeting or might be failing to meet these basic human drives or necessities, such as uh, the the necessity to eat, for instance. And he talks about in a section on why we should perhaps have a uh, a uh, what do you call it, a regulated wage or a guaranteed wage. He said that you know we have this basic need to eat, and that's been kind of one of the things that's been held over our heads so long with capitalism, or even with feudalism, is saying you know you have to work or you have to do this for the king, or this for the boss, and then you'll be able to eat. So we we buy into this system through that. So if we were able to liberate people from that by you know giving them say fifteen thousand dollars a year, he's writing this in the seventies, fifteen thousand dollars a year as a set wage for a given job, then they would be able to they'd be free of that worry about, you know, when am I going to eat next? Am I going to be able to survive this? And then they'd be free to do many other things and develop that full human potential. So he uh, McGovern, by the way, had on his platform to pay every American a certain salary. If, if he's unemployed, he will still have that salary. Yeah. yeah, so we went through that section and actually did apply like the, uh, the psychoanalytical method and saying, you know, this is the need that it's going to meet, therefore freeing up and liberating the individual both from the economic forms and uh, individually or spiritually. He also, and the basic title of the book is Disobedience, he brings in uh, the relationship between obedience and disobedience. So he states uh, early on in the book that human history began with an act of disobedience and it is not unlikely that it will be terminated by an act of obedience. So throughout this book he brings in a lot of stuff around uh, the, uh, the Cold War and the nuclear ramp up and kind of this feeling that, you know, any one of these days, someone can just push the button when they're told to. They obey orders from above, and they're going to push the button that ends the world. And it's kind of a very pervasive fear of that time. So he's saying that, you know, he kind of brings in religion a little bit. He talks about, you know, if you go back to the, the Christian belief that humanity starts with the uh, disobedience and eating of the apple and you know, the, the Eve. The right. Eve, yeah. So, you know, that act of disobedience was the birth of humanity, the birth of human history, you know, separate from the almighty uh, creator or, or whatever almighty force that is saying do this or do that. Human to be free in humanity is to be disobedient at some uh, one point or another. And he looks at modern day and he says, really what we're doing now is we're being utterly obedient. Right? We are what he calls the, uh, the homo consumens. Right? So Marx said we were homo favor originally, the man, the creator. We're able to go out in the world and create and change the world and alter it to make it our own. But now we've come through with capitalism and forms of uh, the economic uh, evolution. Now we are homo consumers, so we're just uh, concerned with consuming as much as possible, maximum consumption, maximum feel good, which he then relates to Freud and the oral fixation, right? Where we're kind of walking around and suckling up of every, everything uh, with our mouths open at all times, right? So I want more food or I want more cars, these types of things. He said very much that's a limiting factor. We're obedient to that, and that obedience makes us part of the power which is held over us. And right? so, if we're obedient, if we buy into the system, 
that we allow it to control us and to tell us what to do. So kind of one of the main theses of this uh, series of uh, essays was to break free of these uh, obedient and uh, very much conformist uh, ties which hold us back from living our full human potential and freedom. He applies then uh, this, uh, this uh, series of obedience and disobedience in talking about you know, where, where does this uh, disobedient seed come from. And he brings up the difference between prophets and priests. This is probably one of the most interesting parts of the, uh, the book. And he, he makes a differentiation between prophets and priests. Prophets are basically people who come out and say new things. They say something which challenges an old ideal, but not only that, not only are they just saying it, but they're also living it at the same time. So in order to be a prophet, you have to live your word. You have to go out and you have to say something new, and then you have to demonstrate it and live that and make that the basis of your life. So we went through, we talked about all the various martyrs we've had, says all of these martyrs who've done something new and then been persecuted for it, they were all prophets. Whereas priests are the ones who take the ideas of the prophets and maybe they continue preaching them right, in churches or even in the academic sense. right? But we build what he called building museums or temples to these ideas which the prophets had. And he says this is in some ways limiting because now we're not saying anything new. We've taken this one idea, maybe this idea doesn't hold anymore, but we're still stuck on it, like with Catholicism or with Judaism or with any of these uh, long-standing religions. So he finds problems there. So if all we're stuck with are priests, like think of the academic setting, right? We've made uh, temples and museums of sociology or psychology. We're focused on those, but we don't necessarily have anyone saying anything new, and that could be problematic. So we need prophets. And he says, in this uh, age in which, you know, we're on the brink of nuclear destruction or environmental destruction. We need people to say new things. We need prophets. And he brings up uh, kind of in the, this essay on priests and prophets, he was very much talking about Bertrand Russell, who was a, a predominant activist and academic and, and thinker at this time. And he says this is kind of the example of what a modern-day prophet could look like, someone who is saying something new and, and looking about, for instance, nuclear disarmament in a way that people aren't necessarily looking at it. And not only that, but he's living it. He's going out in the streets. He's getting arrested, you know, in for protests and things like that. So he's he's talking the talk and walking the walk, saying something new and living it out. Let's see. And he means as a sociological types in that sense. The yeah. As opposed to I mean, because Fromm's not saying that you know God is choosing individuals to be His voice or something like that in the same Islamic or Jewish mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. So so very much it's you know. The person who's coming up, you know, that human, that humanistic side of it. Yeah. You know, it's not that there's some almighty being handing out, you know, you are a prophet, you are a prophet, but right. that this person, through their actions, becomes a prophet. Yeah, it's almost like they're being prophetic. Yeah. As opposed to being a prophet. Yeah, we're all potentially prophets, but if we, you know, kind of conform to the, you know, status quo, then we will not achieve that potential. He makes the distinction I found it was interesting with our uh, discussion of fascism uh, as of late. He, he makes the distinction between the love of life and the, the love of death. Biophilia. Um, yeah, necrophilia. Yeah, necrophilia. Um, but he, he talks about uh, humanists as those who are able to love life and to go about life and, and realizing that we need to recreate ourselves and to attach to living and celebrate life. And then those people who are conforming or who have bought into the, this more radical fascist idea um, as those who long for death. And he brings up a very good example of this in the uh, discussion of the Spanish general, and I forget his name here, but I will look it up. What was that? General uh, Milan Astre during the uh, Spanish Civil War and a discourse between uh, he and a, uh, a scholar named uh, Yuno Mano, I guess I'm not sure his name, but his basically, in, during the Spanish <coughs> Civil War, uh, he was uh, kind of very much uh, looking like a fascist, and his, his saying was, Vivo la muerte, or long live death. And so after he had come to this university and given a speech, uh, saying, and someone stood up and yelled, long live death, and so the scholar gets up, and I'm going to read a, kind of a little section here. So the scholar gets up after hearing this guy cry, long live death. And he said, now I have... Uh, just now I have heard a necrophilous and senseless cry, long live death. And I, who have spent my life shaping paradoxes which have aroused the uncomprehending angers of others, I must tell you, as an expert authority, that this outlandish paradox is repellent to me. 
General Milan Estre is a cripple. Let it be said without any uh, slighting undertone. He is a war invalid. So was Cervantes. Unfortunately, there are too many cripples in Spain just now. So he goes on, he criticizes this general kind of right in front of his face, and then the general gets up and says, down with uh, the intellectuals. Right. Of course. So, of course. Yeah, of course. So, so, and I, I was like, wow, you know, so, you know, this, this is very much the prophetic voice which is needed. Someone to stand up and say, you know, look at all this wrong that's going on. I'll say it right to your face or, you know, you know in front of you and to this crowd who you just preached to and be that counterpoint. So instead of promoting war and loving death, right, and, and not being afraid of death and going into it, let's celebrate life and let's try to, you know, cling to this life that we have and make it as much uh, as is possible. So then he brings this idea into, you know, how do we fix these various issues which we have. And one of the, uh, the big stands that he makes is that today we have basically two major economic systems in the world. We have capitalism and we have what he calls a perverted form of socialism. And he says, you know, socialism kind of forgot its basic point. So to fix this, we need a third in what he calls humanist uh, socialism. And humanistic socialism is basically uh, a system in which people have control. Right? So individuals or the, the collective has control of it. It's not some, you know, like we saw with uh, the communists when then you had Stalin and, and the various other leaders who were, you know, kind of perverting uh, the socialist ideal and, and making it somewhere where it is much less uh, you know, free. So it says, let's, let's apply this, you know, very free democratic process, not only to government, but to the economic system as well. So he actually goes through a series of steps, um, and I won't spell them all out here, but if you're interested, it's a, a good read. And he talks about what it might look like to actually have this humanistic socialism applied to, for instance, the United States. And it's, it's pretty interesting to see someone uh, writing about this in the uh, 1970s and the 60s and 70s. He, he argues for a... Uh, a filter up approach to government or in any economy instead of a filter down, which we have, right? You have someone who's powerful who makes a decision and then everyone kind of accepts it. But he says, no, let's break this up. We'll have all these town hall meetings all around the country and these ideas which are generated will be filtered up to the larger levels instead. So <laughs> he makes a, a mention which is the majority of men, uh, including most of those who are in power, still uh, live emotionally in the Stone Age. Right, so all of these, these people who are in power are very much still clinging to these old ways of doing things. We need to shift and alter in, in a prophetic way to fix some of our major problems, uh, one of which he talks about, which is uh, nuclear disarmament. Right, so it's kind of his, his major activist point here. And he's saying, instead of doing this bilateral disarmament where we say, okay, Russia, you dispose some of your weapons, and we guarantee that we'll dispose some of ours, and that's how we go about it. And he says that's very much rooted in fear and uh, so he applies the psychoanalysis to it. He says, you know, we're we're kind of, you know, kind of ego boasting, and, and we're ruled in fear, and that way we're never going to do it. So instead, we need a unilateral disarmament, which means one side will kind of say, all right, I'm just going to give it up. I'll destroy, you know, X amount of nuclear weapons, and then with the hope then that the other side will follow suit. And he says this will happen, or he hopes that this will happen if we have two rational sides. He said you couldn't do this with someone like Hitler, who was. Uh, what he said was, was slightly insane, right? So someone who would cling to, you know, this, this idea of, of you know, wanting death. But if you have two sides which are rational and which, you know, to some extent want life and they don't want to destroy the world, then if one gives up the nuclear weapons, we hope that the other will follow suit. So it, and then he also applies this to things like uh, uh, aging and old age. So we have a constantly aging populace, and he says that a lot of times we get to old age, we have trouble, right? We have trouble with it. And what does it mean to be old and now we can't uh, participate in society that the way we once did? So we get all these problems that surround old age. And he says maybe we could fix that by bringing the humanist approach to aging and saying that, you know, we should cling to life throughout our life. And when we get old, we should not forget to, uh, you know, when we were old, we were supposed to, you know, go out and uh, be involved in recreation like golf. But instead of recreation, let's make it recreation. Right, let's go out and, and so in our old age we are recreating ourselves and recreating the world ar around us and we're not losing sight of this very humanist ideal. That's kind of a summary of what he's talking about there. Do uh, you guys have any questions or have any points that you wanted to bring up? I'd be more than happy to. Very good. Them. Now if we connect it with what we said before, there is something, the idea, does it appear in, in form? It does appear in the X experience, right? So he called the idea X. 
which means the uh, same thing with Hockheimer and Son. They cannot say anything about it, but it is. And it is, I think, the basis for this hopeful approach, you know, because what gives him really the courage to think that this is possible, you know. And uh, on the other hand, the, 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 those who laugh about idealism, it is idealism in a certain sense, right? To, uh, in a one-sided way, to give up your weapons and hope that the other will be human enough. What, what if he isn't, you know? And it's this fourth commandment of Jesus there, not to take revenge, to hold the other cheek, it's right. Um, and that is where, where this bad name comes from about idealists, you know, it could go wrong. There's a risk there. If the stronger one is doing it, then it's okay. And in a certain sense it has happened because the Soviet Union did not uh, compete with Reagan. You know, they didn't spend another trillion rubles in order to get there and, and uh, they sacrificed in a certain sense the whole system because at that time the atomic lock was already 10 minutes to 12 so, mm -hmm. you know, it could all have happened, the duel, uh, Kiev taking out and uh, Baltimore taking out and so on. So uh, they, they did it and uh, we did not abuse the moment, neither. I mean, uh, he can spend all that money, but he didn't uh, didn't attack in any way, so he came even close to it. So, but that is what what I so on one side Freud looks at the uh, at the situation, you know, in which one should be disobedient, and he describes the situation, and that a part of this could do too. But there is a plus with him, you know that he says that what is the case is not right and something else has to happen. So this something else is the X experience. Uh, it is not man as such. It is something beyond man which makes man find himself, coming home to himself, which is the definition of freedom. So um, the, uh, it may not have been stressed in there, but there is this having and uh, being and so on where where this X experience, you know, thing comes through there, or the city of being, you know, in which uh, so the city of God, in the past, and the city of progress, and then the city of being, and you know, to get there, we have to do this, this disarmament and so on. And so the dissidence has been done. I mean, under fascism, a lot of people were disobedient, you know, and were executed for it, and didn't serve in the armed forces and. And so, by the way, interesting part of there were two farmers from Bavaria who refused to serve in the German army. And there was no uh, conscientious objector law in, in Germany. So, and the church people went with them to the execution and said the state was right, you know. So there you have that uh, the type of priestly religion, you know, which is a very good example. So, but. Uh, we had discussed with the rabbi there about prophets. He said, I'm so happy, you know, that there are no prophets anymore. They were all troublemakers. And, and we, you know, at the end of, uh, the beginning of the rabbinical paradigm, you know, we we got rid of them. And we hope we'll never come back again. Well, we love to kill prophets, right? I mean, well, comes up, we I mean, say you're not yeah. really a prophet. You know, yeah. we'll tell you that a hundred years later, we're like, oh, hey, okay, we're a prophet. I, I mean, the ironical <laughs> sentence where Jesus says, you know, has everybody heard that the prophet was was murdered outside of Jerusalem, you know. It was in Jerusalem itself where the prophets were killed and he, he included. So, very good. Yeah. Any other question? Do we have any other question? I think the interesting thing about necrophilia and biophilia is not only the, you know, this, this commitment towards death, but it's also the commitment towards that which is dead, right? Mm. So, somehow... Yeah. They talk about the con homo consumers, the consumer society, as a necrophilic society because it's a, it's a fundamental commitment to the acquisition of more dead stuff, mm. as opposed to a commitment to the living, right? Mm. I mean, the living is simply ignored. What's important is that I get that new car, or that bigger house, and whatnot. That's the necrophilic in that sense, right. you know. So yeah. that in that case, the whole capitalistic system yeah, right. is necrophilic. So it's very hard because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the capital which you have uh, is dead labor. It was living labor transformed into dead labor, and then you use the dead labor and apply it again to living labor in order to get dead labor again. So right. it is there's something deadening in, in, the, in the whole process, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So it's important that we uh, relate all that, you know, to the um, system in which we live. 
which we always are conditioned to say, well, it's not so bad. You know, it's not so bad as form where he describes it and so on. And, uh, but it is important to see that that what is the idea makes them able to see it differently. While when you leave the idea out, as we, unfortunately we have it in sociology, see, in our sociology department, uh, which are all positivists, but we have the wonderful thing that they are tolerant enough to let people come in who still have an idea, in spite of the fact that they may not understand that part. You know. And uh, when, when these Ger West Germans came and stole all the chairs in East Germany and the universities, then the students always wanted to know, you know, how a new society, what that would look like. And these positivistic professors said, why the hell don't you just study what is, you know, and forget <laughs> about the whole thing. They, you see, in, in practical experience, where this idea, this X thing there, you know, or this totally other or so, where it comes in, and that when the opposite happens, when all otherness is cancelled, that is the Jewish experience. The Jewish experience is a fascism which cancels otherness, because the Jew was that foreigner, he was the other, you see. And uh, that is also in that fight against... Uh, the equality idea there. So the Hitler thought that the Jews were that otherness which ruined the world by bringing this idea of equality in it, but an inclusive equality, not we Germanic tribesmen, we are all equal, British and German and so on, and then there are these other people out there and there's no room for them. And so at the end he was happy for all those who killed him, he regretted that he had not wiped out all otherness. Uh, Fromm definitely talked about that with his mm -hmm. humanist socialism. He yeah. mentioned that when it comes to equality, it's not saying that we all have to be the same. So yeah. equality yeah, right. is yeah. not sameness. No. no. You know, yeah. So we should celebrate that diversity within. Exactly. The and that is the dialectical part, see? Because if you make uh, equality, you know, without differentiation, then you have the guillotine. Then you had cats, uh, head, uh, cut heads off, which are a little bit bigger or so, you know, that becomes very deadly. That's behind terrorism, by the way. Terrorism is that angry, making everything equal. No otherness is allowed anymore. So, um, so one must uh, take it very dialectically, the whole thing. Yeah, that's very good. Okay, anything else? Do we have any other question? Good paper, so let's do it the same way the next time. Two of you, and then everybody has an opportunity, right? Very good. And now we want to look at the capitalistic. We talked about this Odysseus there. We want to see what, what he looks like in, in New York and, and so on. The movie shows us two types of capitalists, and that is important too. Uh, the one whom we will see there, in the center, is a Wall Street capitalist, whom Ford, you know, would, be, would condemn unproductive capital. Uh, uh, speculative capital, but there is another capitalist who comes up, the old-fashioned one, who still works and is productive and produces things, etc. And the guy who comes from Wall Street wants to kill him off there, uh, buying him off and so on, and we see them. We don't have to see the whole thing, but just tonight we what can... Movie? Hmm? What movie? Yeah, here's the movie. Other people's people money. money. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit funny, but we need funniness too. Funny. Dr. Siebert, did yeah. you say you had the exams that you had graded? Yeah. For those of the okay. Okay, I have, I have um, a 30, Simon, Simon, that's you. But I wanted to discuss a little bit, or you can bring it the next time again. I just I was just going to look at it. You can yeah, no, you can keep it, so. And then, let me see, do I have another one? Okay. Now, this is not yet, I have not used it through yet. I will do that for the next time. And, uh... I'll look at this for the next time, right? Oh. I have not looked it through yet. You just gave it to me today, right? Yeah. Um, okay, but then I have one here. The John yes. Patton, too. Yes. Okay, very good. 
Okay, that is, and I have another one here. Uh, is it Al Sunaidi? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay, that is, I think, all, and then look through the two and bring them back the next time. Okay. And think a little bit about that, what we did today, and see if we can get our head around it. There he is. Let's look at him. There, in the last stage of Odysseus, there you see him. You don't care which God I pray for. There are only three things that make the loudest back on kind of unconditional acceptance.
tell me. Trouble is being sued by the townspeople, sir. Failed to comply with environmental restrictions. And there are claims of illness from the citizenry. Good. <laughs> Just before they cart it off the jail, make a bid. Yes, sir. Hey, Kelly. No, Eastern Motel. Yeah, that's exploits the everything, theory. even the environmental uh, issues. Six million, Mr. Gar. Play on two and a half million. Mr. Morgan, sir, wants to talk to you. I'd rather talk to my mother. Piper. Yeah. What about this New England wire and cable? That's so beautiful. Anyway. Is it booby trap? I, uh... He is not I, the right uh, material there. I, uh... I... can't seem to find any problems, Mr. Garfield. The shark he must cannot. see the weakness, and he cannot find any weakness. Richardson! Yes, sir. Let's talk to these people. Call the man in charge, whoever the hell he is. Yes, sir. We'll get right on. Now, this is the old capitalist. Here's the productive one, the secretary. Good morning, Good morning. Oh, yes. Good morning. Lovely, Mr. Cole. Who's out there, Cole? Just one moment, please. What he wants. He wants to come up and see us. Look the place over, he said. Well, what's wrong with that? He's a shareholder. Well, it's not that simple. What this man does is no secret. Well, you got the jitters. Wall Street's in the liquidation business these days, Jorvi. My father founded this company 81 years ago. I took over 26 years ago. I, know. I control this company, and nobody's going to liquidate us. See, this is the owner. He would never become a stockholder in his own firm. Here comes the useless capital speculator. Wonderful fall day. But he's never seen any nature or whatever. No bridge closures. <laughs>
Sugar and cream? Sugar, I'll take care of it. Thank you, Emma. I can have Emma get some donuts. Donuts. Why don't we get down to business? What's the matter? You're not interested in donuts? Would you like me to get some donuts? No, no, no never mind, Emma.
you better get your elevator fixed. There's a goddamn fire raging here, and this whole industry's up in flames. And you call a fire department, and who shows up? Nobody. Because they're all in Japan, and Singapore, and Malaysia, and Taiwan, and every other shithole where they're crazy well, about pollution. And while that inferno is raging, you're out in front, mowing the lawn, <laughs> tidying up, playing with your pots on my money! You think I was asking him for a loan? Good day, Mr. Garfield.
come in and take some of the uh, cookies.